If you don't mind, would you please pause with me for a moment of prayer? Dear God, we know that wherever we are, you are also. And therefore, we count this as holy ground. God, we ask that the openness of our hearts, minds, and souls reflect the sacred nature of this place. We ask you to speak now, for we are listening. In Christ Jesus and in love we do pray. Amen. 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 In my mere 20 years of life, I have come to find that much of human communication is structured around one thing, and that is questions. I often find my own self asking a plethora of questions. I ask myself things like, why are gas prices so high? <laughs> I ask myself, why does my tuition exceed the amount of scholarships that I had? I ask myself, why does the amount of violence in my community continue to rise along with the number of churches on every corner? You see, life is filled with all sorts of questions like these. In addition to everyday life questions, as Christians, we have even more questions that flood our mind. We have even more inquisitions in the life of a Christian. When we have an issue or a question, we sift through scripture seeking to find a solution. The longer we live, we soon come to realize that even the Bible cannot extinguish all of the questions that burn within us. This is because the more answers that come, the more, the more questions that arise. It seems that along with an answer comes another question. Often it appears to me that the Bible leads us to many more questions instead of answers. Yet we find in the 27th chapter of Matthew a question that has seemed to find its partner. It seems that it has found the answer it was looking for. This one question has found its match. Mm -hmm. This question is one of the Bible's most memorable questions. It has been pinned and we can still hear the echoes. We can still feel the aftershocks of the words that floated across the very lips of Pontius Pilate in the 22nd verse of Matthew 27. Pontius Pilate was an up and coming politician that was sent by Roman authorities to be the governor of Judea. It was another typical day for Pontius Pilate. He was sitting back relaxing in his governor mansion. He was sitting back in Jerusalem and all of the sudden, all of the sudden, when he was sitting back in his governor mansion, Pilate's chambers were stampeded by some red in the face, hot under the collar, Jews. These Jews stormed in demanding the execution of a man we know as Jesus. If you will allow me to use my illustrative imagination here for a moment, I submit to you that I cannot help but think that this is not the first time Pilate has heard about this man named Jesus. This is because it was in the same geographical location that Pilate was governor, that Jesus was being requested for execution. And two, it was the same place that Jesus was performing miracles. All this took place in Jerusalem. It was in this same place that Jesus fed the multitude. It was in this same place that Jesus calmed the storm and turned water into wine. I tell you, it was in Jerusalem that Jesus was not only known by the name on his birth certificate, but he was also known by his nature. It was in Jerusalem that he was not only called Jesus, but he was also known as a healer. He was not only known as a healer, he was also known as an encourager. He was not only known as encourager, but he was also known as a peacemaker. Not only was Jesus known as a peacemaker, but Jesus was also known as living water in a barren land. In Jerusalem, he was known as a waymaker. 
I tell you, it was in Jerusalem that God exemplified itself through Jesus. And it is now in Jerusalem that the Jews want to execute him. So for a few moments, Pilate took a step back and he began to ask Jesus a number of questions. He took the time to question Jesus about the accusations that had come against him. And through a series of questions, after he had put Jesus through the test, after he had put Jesus through the interview, he came to find that this man was innocent. He quickly determined that Jesus had committed no capital offense. But still, Pilate did not know what to do. He had had an innocent man on his hands, but he did not know what to do because he had an angry crowd right outside. The crowd outside of his walls wanted the man dead. Pilate simply did not know what to do next. He could not just ignore Jesus, and because he was a politician, also known as one who is dependent on the opinion of the public, he could hardly ignore the irate Jews. So he asked the masses this one question, what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? He asked the masses, what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? I had to pause there for a moment because I see that Pilate has just made a crucial mistake. When one is making a decision for or about Christ Jesus, it must be personal. Through this question, we see and we are able to get a sneak peek at not Pilate the politician, not even Pilate with power. We see Pilate the people pleaser. Oftentimes we view those in higher positions with great power. But posing this question in this text, Pilate, Pilate has now relinquished his power and authority to the crowd. He has given up the power that he had and he had put it in the hands of the crowd. Yeah. It is unfortunate that Pilate was more concerned about the opinions of the people instead of doing what he believed to be right. He had already found this man was innocent, yet he still acted like he did not know what to do. Don't we see this happening all too much in our very own communities? There are too many people worried about the opinions of others. We see too many people worried about what their family, friends, and peers will think. We cannot be like Pilate and let others pilot our own lives. You see, Pilate made a choice, a choice to abandon an innocent man to a furious mob. When Pilate did this, I could not help but to ask myself a few questions. And the root one word for all my questions was, why? Why would this political leader in a prominent position give Jesus over to this angry crowd? And why would this crowd seek to execute him? As I pondered these questions, I could only come up with one possible answer. They simply didn't know who Jesus was. The crowd was more willing to crucify that which they did not understand. They could not understand why this man was calling himself the fulfillment of the prophecy. They could not understand why this man was able to heal others. They could not understand who Jesus really was. And so they said, we might as well crucify him. Pilate did not understand that not only was he turning over an innocent man to the crowd, but when turning over Jesus to the crowd, he was also giving up on peace. When you relinquish Jesus to the crowd, he was also giving up joy. When he relinquished Jesus to the crowd, he was giving up on patience. When he released Jesus over, he was giving up on equality. Pilate was giving up kindness to the crowd. Pilate did not know that he had the Son of Man at his political fingertips. Never let it be said of you, never let it be said of us that we turn Jesus over to the crowds. Yes, there are crowds in our own lives. Don't let Jesus be turned over for the crowd of money. Some might even give Jesus up for just another opportunity to preach behind a large pulpit. Don't give up Jesus to the crowd. Pilate gave Jesus up because he was a people pleaser. But some of us give up Jesus for whole other reasons. 
Pilate's question to the crowd will never be forgotten. For I can still hear the question resounding in my very ears today. There are times when such a powerful and dynamic question is asked that we are often left wondering what happened. When a question is asked about our communities, we often get no answer. But that is not so in this text. In this text, we find the crowd shouted a two-word clear answer. They shouted, crucify him. When Pilate asked them, what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? They said, crucify him. But I have some good news for you this morning. I'm glad to tell you that you don't have to accept the answer that is given in the text. Do not be like Pilate and let the crowd pilot your answer to the question, what should I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? The crowd shouted that they wanted to kill Jesus, but I'm so glad that they could not kill Christ. The crowd wanted the life of Jesus, but they couldn't take Christ. The crowd's answer was crucify him, but my answer is simply this, let him live. Let Christ live. And you may be asking yourself, how can I let Christ live? Let Christ live by bringing joy into every room you enter. Let Christ live by being courteous to one another. Let Christ live by feeding the hungry. Let Christ live by clothing the naked. Let Christ live by using preaching to unify the church. Let Christ live by showing equality to everyone, no matter their skin color, no matter their sex, no matter their sexual orientation, yeah. no matter their socioeconomic status, let Christ live by showing love to everyone at all times. And so the question is now yours. What will you do with Jesus who is called Christ? I encourage you today to let Christ live inside of you. Allow the Christ in you to live on forevermore. And as I close, I leave with the song. The songwriter said, he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Oh, I tell you, he walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You may be asking how I know that he lives. I tell you, he lives within my heart. Amen. Amen.